Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Anima Patil Sable. Uh, yes, the, uh, I'm going to talk about the Artemis missions, basically, but I'm using the same disk of, and deck of slides, Deep Space Dreams Making the Impossible Possible. Um, why I had it titled quickly was a um, couple of things. One was humanity as humans. We are making this attempt to go set up sustainable bases on the moon and Mars, right? Uh, which is something impossible because we are not designed to live and work in the harsh environment of space. And we are trying to make that happen. So that was one reason. And then I talked about the physio-psychological challenges of um, long duration deep space missions for humans um, in, this, in, in that previous deck of slides. Um, and then the other reason was because uh, my own personal journey uh, with started with a childhood dream of wanting to become an astronaut, and I'm still pursuing that uh, goal. Um, growing up, there were not many opportunities in India, and so I ended up coming here. And at a very late stage, I decided I still want to give it, uh, give this an, um, a shot, give my goal, uh, my dream. Um, so I wanted to see where it takes me. I don't know if it will, I'll succeed or not, but at least I'll have the satisfaction I tried, right? And so that was another uh, reason. I'm trying to make something impossible uh, possible. So let's get started a little bit about me. Uh, that's a lot about me, but yes, these are, uh, I haven't updated these pictures since some time, but um, I am a very active person, as you can see, not only in, uh, my pursuits towards my goal, but also in cultural activities, representing or keeping our India alive here in the US. I have a bachelor's in physics and master's in computer applications from North Maharashtra University, um, Jalgaon. Um, and then uh, I did a, when I came to the US, so I worked for a couple of years in Mumbai as a software engineer after I finished my MCA. And then I came um, to the US um, as a software consultant. And while working here, I was watching the space shuttles launch regularly. I was in California at that time. I knew there was a NASA center um, near our home. So that kind of triggered this thought again, let me do something about this, even though it's kind of late. So when I had a three-year-old uh, and a full-time job, I started my second master's, which, is, which was in aerospace engineering at the San Jose State University. And um, while doing that, I had my second son as well. So it was very challenging at that time, but I kept at it. After my master's, I kept applying to NASA, but you need to be a US citizen. And I was not one at that time. So, but four or five years was persistent. And finally I got the call uh, from the hiring manager for uh, NASA's Kepler mission. And the first question they asked was, are you a US citizen? I told him not yet, but I'm going to become one in a month. And they uh, called me in for an interview. So uh, just one interview with a group of scientists, engineers, managers. They really liked my aerospace and software background. And I was hired for that um, job. And since then, I've been working for NASA, worked on the Kepler mission. I'll talk a little bit about Kepler in a few slides. Um, then I also worked in NASA's Intelligent Systems Division uh, at NASA Ames in California. And um, like almost four years ago now, I moved to Houston because I was eager to work in the human spaceflight program <laughs> because all human spaceflight happens in Houston. But my boys were younger and we wanted to raise them in California at that time. So I had to keep putting it off. And finally, now they were older, I could convince them and we moved here. And I've been working um, uh, at NASA's Johnson Space Center here. I was the Orion Spacecraft Simulations Lab Manager earlier. And now I'm managing the or leading the project to set up the Mission Control Center systems for Lunar Gateway. I'll talk about that as well in a little bit. And I'm also pursuing my um, PhD in Systems Engineering. Yeah, before that I did a PhD, uh, uh, sorry, a Master's in Space Studies. So yeah, I was saying, very busy. I'm like a, a lifelong student. <laughs> I call myself uh, always eager to study and learn a lot of new things, but also very active um, socially. I've been a um, Boy Scout assistant scout master for about 11 years now. Um, and um, doing all these things that you see in these pictures, I won't go into those details. Um, 
when I started working on the Kepler mission, I became a NASA speaker and um, started talking about Kepler here in the US at schools. And then um, I went to India in 2014 and I was invited at my alma mater, the North Maharashtra University and my school, St. Joseph's Convent High School um, in Jilgaon. And my story there, how I went from Jilgaon to NASA got a little bit of an attention and I saw people really wanted to know not more about the Kepler, but how I got from there to here. And so I started sharing that story as well. And my goal behind all of this has been, I did not get the guidance growing up. So I want to provide that guidance um, to the younger generation. And I've been doing that through these talks. And uh, these are just a few pictures. Um, also staying physically fit I, because I have this goal and it's really important. But anyways, it is important to stay physically fit, right? Um, no matter what your profession. So I strive to do that. Um, this is a picture of me when I did my master's in space studies for the project for the master's. I, I developed an augmented reality capable, I mean, augmented reality app to use on the Microsoft HoloLens and I'm testing it out in our um, space suit. So, and then apart from my full-time job, I was looking at how I can build those skills that are needed to become an astronaut. And I wanted to challenge myself. So I signed up for a couple of analog missions and I got selected. Um, I was a commander actually for NASA's Mars. Uh, I'm mixing both of them. See, I'm still sleepy. <laughs> Sorry about that. NASA's HERA, Human Exploration and Research Analog. This is a picture from HERA mission. And this is a picture from uh, Mars Desert Research Station, which is the Mars Society's. This is a non-NASA um, Mars analog, basically. So I got to experience or taste both the flavors of analog missions. NASA's is more constrained, contained, and more driven by the mission control center. It's more controlled kind of an environment. Um, but here we were, for the Mars analog, we were on our own. We had to design our own mission, lead our own mission on figure out what we're going to do during the mission. So um, that was good to experience both sides. Um, and I, I really enjoyed these experiences. It taught me a lot and I could contribute to some research um, towards uh, psychological effects of isolation and confinement for long durations, right? So that that's one thing. Then I also trained as a scientist astronaut candidate for Project Foxum. Um, now I, I'm a bioastronautics researcher. After training, I've flown research missions to test the performance of this spacesuit. And there is another one. I don't have pictures of that. I think I removed those. Uh, an orange spacesuit. Um, that was the first one that I trained in and I flew research missions in this Falcon 20 aircraft. It's a modified aircraft, experimental aircraft. We fly parabolas. Um, and when you fly parabolas at the top of the parabola, you experience zero gravity or microgravity. And during that, those few seconds of microgravity, you perform tasks to test the performance of the spacesuit. So that's what I've um, done. I've flown about 56 parabolas in this Falcon 20, no, 20 aircraft. And I've also flown research missions in Canada, high Alberta, um, to study noctilus in clouds because they appear at higher latitudes, right? So we went to up to the 60th degree latitude. And I flew in this Mooney aircraft, um, so it was an uh, un unpressurized aircraft. We had to put on our oxygen masks and all that stuff. So, yeah, I've been doing this on the side to build build my skills. It's been a while since I've flown. Um, the last one I flew was in um, 2018. I flew so many missions until then. Um, now I've taken a break because now I'm at NASA here. At that time, I had a little bandwidth, but right now my schedule is so full. And I enjoy being a test subject here at NASA's Johnson Space Center also. But this experience put me through um, trainings, right? Where I'm pulling um, G-forces. How is my body handling that? Where, where I am in a hypoxic chamber and um, could I recognize the symptoms of hypoxia? You need to know that if you're a pilot or an astronaut and flying a, an airplane or a spacecraft to recognize the symptoms of hypoxia um, so that you can save your own and your passengers life, right? Um, or crewmates life when you're in a spacecraft. 
So that was the training in um, hyperbaric, hyperbaric chamber um, in Florida. So these um, experiences were really, um, uh, they helped me realize the potential of my um, physique. How can I handle all of this? And um, so it, it, it was really helpful. I could test myself, challenge myself. Um, apart from the bioastronautics researcher uh, work for Project Possum, I've also um, spun in a centrifuge. There is a video of that out there. I can share the link if you want to check it out. There was a FAA study. FAA is the Federal Aviation Administration here in the US that manage all our skies. So um, they wanted to see now that we are going to start flying um, private spacecrafts, right? Like Virgin Galactic, SpaceX, and Blue Origin. And they're going to fly tourists eventually. So do we need to train civilians um, on how to handle G-forces? Because when the G-forces set on, um, not everyone experiences it the same or reacts the same. Some people can get really violent because your body goes through a lot when you're experiencing G-forces, even two G-forces. You feel like your cheeks, your skin, it, muscles, everything is getting pulled down towards the earth, even your eyes. And if you are in that situation, pulling a lot of G-forces for a long time, then you will pass out eventually, right? Because all the blood is getting pulled away from your brain. So your brain is basically being deprived of oxygen. And um, when your brain is deprived of oxygen, what will happen? You'll pass out. So we, um, that was the study they wanted to understand. Um, should we train civilians to handle G-forces? And so I pulled up to six G-forces uh, in that um, centrifuge. And um, the thing was my body can handle G-forces really well. So I did not pass out even after pulling G-forces. I was still standing and I could... But I did give my feedback that, yes, we do need to train civilians because in a closed space, in a spacecraft, if there are two people and one is not trained and doesn't know how to, what will, what is going to happen, then they are going to react violently. And they will say, hey, let me out of here. I don't want to um, go anywhere. And so that, that you don't want to be in that situation. So training civilians is better, uh, at least a basic training on what happens to your body when you go through G-forces. So, yeah, these are the kind of research um, studies I've been participating in and uh, challenging myself. I've also done a land and sea survival training um, because was not, I was never into water growing up, right? <laughs> never a swimmer when I was growing up in India. But when I came here, I knew I had to um, learn swimming because astronauts have to learn, I have to know how to swim. Um, and so I took swimming lessons. I was good at swimming, but um, beyond five feet, it was a scary feeling for me to venture. But when I did my scuba certification, I had to go to the bottom of the pool at 12 feet to the bottom. And that was a challenge for some reason. I had skydived on my birthdays from 15,000 feet and I was fine, uh, not scared. I enjoyed that experience, but at the bottom of the ocean, uh, not ocean, sorry, pool, but even in the ocean, it was a scary feeling because it's deep, right? So every each of us has a fear. And I discovered my fear. That was the first time ever I had a fear. Until then, I was fearless. Nothing could scare me. But yes, I discovered that. I struggled with that for a day. I hurt myself, bruised myself, struggling to get out of the uh, pool. And not having a good instructor did not help either. <laughs> so, uh, But eventually, I conquered my fear. I calmed myself down that day when I came home that I have to do th this. This is the first time I'm experiencing this. So uh, it was difficult to accept at first, but um, I'm someone with a positive attitude and I love challenges. <clears throat> so I told myself, I have to do this. I'm not going to give up. That, is this a small reason that I'm going to give up everything that I've done so far? And so after that, it's all in the head, I told myself. And I went back the next day and there was another instructor, the instructor who was, who had pulled me into the water forcefully, was fired. <laughs> I didn't even complain about him. There were other students who were watching and instructors who were watching and they, um, they informed the management and he was fired. But the next day, um, there was a good patient instructor with me. She, she really took me through it and, um, uh, I could complete my certification. 
So basically what I'm trying to say is don't give up. And if you have some goal, yes, don't let any fear or any hurdle hold you back. Okay. A bad instructor hold you back either. And then after that, I went into the ocean and I um, worked on my sea survival skills. So it was fun. I, it, this is me here <laughs> in this corner. And then we did some land survival skills. <coughs> I'm sorry. And then here I'm under the pool inside the water upside down because I'm in a chair basically buckled up in the chair. What we're trying is spacecraft emergency egress. I'm wearing goggles on my eyes. I can't see anything basically. It's supposed to be dark. And I'm, then I'm turned upside down. I have to unbuckle myself. I'm breathing from an, uh, a bottle of air. Uh, and then I have to find the S emergency exit and come out of it. So that was a spacecraft emergency egress training. So, yep, these are the kind of things. This is a summary of um, um, everything you've seen. Um, and right now I'm at NASA's Johnson Space Center. I started off uh, as the Orion spacecraft uh, simulations lab manager. So this is the mock-up of the Orion spacecraft behind me. Uh, basically was hosting all the flight software that Orion is going to fly with. Um, you know, it's, it's a fully automated spacecraft, right? So it's going to fly uh, fully automated. Now you've seen what's been going on with the Artemis 1 mission, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, but yeah, Orion um, flight software is what I was hosting in our lab and tools to uh, test out various scenarios um, of that of failures with the software. So I provided this to the NASA user community um, and was managing all of that. Um, that was a great experience working with a spacecraft that's actually going to fly. Um, and then I am now, this is a mission control center here behind me, but it's for the ISS, the International Space Station. A similar mission control center is being set up for Lunar Gateway, which is going to be a space station around the moon. And I'm leading the project to set that up. Um, while at uh, JSC, I get to be a human test subject. So I go through a physical, annual physical Air Force Type 3 checkup every year. Um, and then if I'm approved, I get to participate in these studies. Here, if you look at me, I'm wearing the virtual reality goggles. I'm seeing the surface of our, uh, Mars in front of me. So I'm on Mars, basically, and I'm performing tasks. Um, there is... Uh, what is that? An electrode connected behind my ear. So we have a neurovestibular organ behind our ear, which is really tiny. And it controls our um, sense of direction, our orientation, our balance, um, up and down. So when you pass an electrical stimulus to it, you get disoriented, basically. And that's how astronauts feel when they are in space, in zero gravity, right? And there is no sense of direction. There is no up or down. And so um you guys are still with me right i didn't lose you okay good <laughs> just want to make sure because i can't see uh when when i'm looking at my slides okay so um yeah so what we are trying to do here is when astronauts have traveled for seven eight nine months whatever months they will travel right um, it can be eight or nine months basically to mars they will have been in zero gravity for such a long duration of time and what that does is um it causes bone and muscle atrophy uh, because you're not using your legs. So you start losing your bone and muscle in your legs, especially. Um, then you are disoriented for sure. But our, our brains adapt after a couple of days in space. Uh, but when you arrive back in gravity, it's if you have watched astronauts who return from the space station on in Soyuz spacecrafts, for example, um, they have to be helped to get out of the spacecraft, right? They are literally lifted out of the spacecraft. And then they are carried because they cannot just jump out and start walking. We've been in zero gravity for so long. We've, they've not used their legs for so long. So it's like our body forgets how to walk. And so they have to learn how to walk again. So imagine here on Earth, there are people to help them do that. But when they arrive on Mars, there will be no one, right, to help them with that. And so they will have to help themselves. So how are they going to do that? Because um, they will not be able to start walking immediately. So our imagination has been, okay, astronauts will come on Mars. 
they will start setting up their habitats and get going immediately but that's not going to be happening in reality they will need some time to adapt to the martian gravity which is what 38% of earth's gravity so it's even reduced so and we don't know how the human body is going to behave there right um how much effort we are going to need is it going to be easier or harder and so we are going to um need to train them and that's basically what we are testing out here so when astronauts return to earth they have to perform some exercises one involves crossing your arms walking toe to toe and imagine doing that when your eyes are um closed and that's how you are when you are disoriented um so that's what i'm doing that there uh, i also got an opportunity to work on the nasa's new space suit the xemu extravehicular mobility um unit uh this is the orion spacecraft simulations lab that i was managing these are the displays that are going to be in the similar displays are going to be in the orion spacecraft when we fly astronauts right now the spacecraft that sit in on top of the sls at kennedy space center that doesn't have this displays because it's an unmanned flight right you don't need uh, displays for an unmanned flight but when you have people in the spacecraft you need displays to tell them what is going on with their spacecraft the telemetry data um their trajectory data so all of that is going to be on here so we started setting these up in our labs testing them out and that's what i am doing here i got to test uh, i mean check out a couple of them um that were set up in one of our labs so i get to do all of this at jsc i get to meet astronauts uh, sunita williams ma'am josh kasara he just flew on crew 5 uh, on the dragon uh day before yesterday that was a very smooth launch i don't know if you guys saw that and um spacex like always bought back the boosters and set them down on that what is that um ship in the ocean it's it has a funny name i don't remember but yeah it landed back so that was a good flight but josh kasara and sunita williams ma'am were supposed to fly on Bo- boeing's starliner i'm not sure what's going on with that spacecraft but yeah they haven't flown yet uh, the first flight of starliner hasn't happened yet um so josh kasara got boosted up and he could fly sooner uh, but they were training in one of our labs and so i got to watch them train i got to meet them so it was um, an amazing experience how humble and down to earth um, our astronauts are um so they're doing such amazing things but yet so humble and down to earth and that's one trait i learned from them kepler mission a little bit uh, and then we'll get to the moon <laughs> back to the moon uh, so uh, i worked on the kepler mission for uh, almost 4 years kepler was a school bus sized spacecraft it is still out there it was launched in 2009 to look for earth like planets around sun like stars in their habitable zones um we knew there are planets around um stars and we had i think looked at some of them from earth based telescopes but we want to see if around other stars there are earth sized planets because we want to answer the question are we alone is there life intelligent life like us out there and that's what we were you know, kepler's uh, mission objective was so um because this was the first time we were launching a telescope like this Uh, it had a spectrometer not a, an actual camera a photometer or a spectrometer what that does is it measures the light coming from a star so you look at this picture here uh, kepler is measuring the light coming from the star it's coming as a straight line right this is the straight line once the planet starts crossing it is going to dim some amount of light no matter how big or small the planet is and that is going to get captured that's how sensitive kepler's photometer was it could detect these tiny dips in the light coming from the star and then once this planet has crossed the light is back up again so these dips are called transitions and this is what kepler was looking for and when we found these dips our software would process that and then we would provide the output to the astronomers and the scientists they would look at the um, pictures and the data and they would be able to tell if there are there is one planet two planet how pla- how big are these planets around these stars how far are they because kepler's laws there are three Kep- laws planetary laws uh, using that you can tell how far um the planet is from its star how big is it uh, what is its orbital period so kepler had to 
Kepler had a baseline mission of observing one all the stars that were assigned to it basically for three and a half years. So it finished its baseline mission. Um, then there were four gyroscopic wheels that were helping it um, stay stable uh, so that it could point up to 3000 light years away. But one of the gyroscopic wheels failed. We said, okay, that's fine. We can manage. That was a backup wheel anyways. Then the second failed and then Kepler started getting this jitter. And so it couldn't up to long distances. It couldn't focus really well. So um, NASA repurposed the mission, asked for proposals. And then we had the K2 mission, which was um, not only studying habitable zone planets, but also other objects. So bottom line, Kepler has given us amazing data. It has shown us not only is there a planet around every star in our galaxy, but there are multiple multi-planetary systems out there, just like ours as well. So basically, there are more planets in our solar system um, than stars, right? And there are a lot of habitable zone planets around M dwarf stars. Now, M dwarf stars are more in number in our galaxy uh, than G dwarf type stars. Our sun is a G dwarf. M dwarfs are smaller, cooler. And I can go about this, see, uh, because I have another deck of Kepler slides, right? So uh, I start getting into more details, but I don't want to focus on Kepler. But yeah, I got to work on Kepler. I also got to use NASA supercomputer, uh, Pleiades, when I was working on this mission, because we were processing a huge amount of data data from Kepler. We had to process at least three years worth of data to find, to confirm that um, this planet, if it has an orbital period like our Earth, one year, uh, then then to confirm that it was indeed a planet and rule out false data, th the goal was to st study a star for at least three years. Um, and that is that is why the amount of data grew. And so we had to use the um, supercomputer because our local clusters couldn't handle that um, data. But yeah, it was amazing to work on this mission, great experience, and I did a lot of talks about Kepler as well. Uh, now, coming to humanities, return to the moon. So we are going back to the moon um, in the Artemis missions. Uh, first thing is the previous missions that we flew and we landed a man on the moon or humans on the moon was Apollo missions, right? They were the Apollo missions. They were all men at that time. This is the first time we'll be flying the first woman um, to the moon and the next man. Artemis in Greek mythology is Apollo's twin sister. And because we're flying a woman to the moon now, hence the name Artemis. So that's an interesting um, story there about Artemis. Um, so why are we going back to the moon? Why not Mars? We've already been to the moon. We've been there, done that. So why are we going back to the moon? That's a question a lot of people ask. And that is because Mars is really, really far, right? Millions of miles away. Um, we don't have technologies that we have tested for our astronauts to be able to live and survive on Mars. What are they going to need? Mars is a harsh environment. Uh, just 1% of our atmosphere 95% of that atmosphere is carbon dioxide. So we will need space suits. We will need habitats to live in. And uh, we will have to use new space suits, not the ones that we are using on uh, the space station. Um, those cannot work um, back on the moon now. Uh, they're outdated. They're heavy. Um, they There are very few of them left now. And um, they will, I mean, they've been known to cause injuries to our astronauts nails coming off and um, injuries to the elbows and the fingers. So yeah, we cannot go to the moon and Mars with those. So we'd need a totally new space suit. That is why NASA is working on the XCMU space suit. And na now NASA has awarded a contract to a couple of uh, companies to build a new space suit for us for the moon missions. But yeah, we'll need space suit, we'll need habitats, we will need rovers. So Without testing them, yeah, we can test them on Earth, but is it the similar environment to the Moon and Mars? No. Um, so what is the most analogous environment? I mean, the space station, even the space station, if you look at it, it's only 250 miles above the surface of Earth. So it is closer to Earth and it is protected by, from the radiation by Earth's magnetic field, right? The intergalactic and cosmic radiation, which is the most harmful ionizing radiation. Um, that can affect not only our bodies, 
but also uh, material out there, like even the rovers and the spacecraft, all the machinery that we take up there, we have to think of hardening it for radiation. So uh, we, even if we test it on the space station, it's still not uh, a really similar environment to Mars. Um, and if we send it all the way to Mars and our astronauts, um, if something breaks, some they need our help, we cannot help them because it's that far away. Uh, one trip costs us like eight to nine months. What is the most analogous environment to Mars? It's the moon. That is why we are using the moon as a test bed to test out our technologies that our astronauts are going to need to live and thrive on Mars. So we're going to establish a sustainable base on the moon um, and we're going to start with Artemis um, 3. That's when we are landing two humans on the moon, boots on the ground. Um, so the bottom line is we want to become Earth independent, right? Right now here, space station, you see, is it is Earth dependent. We are launching uh, all this stuff, the food, um, fruits, everything for the astronauts clothing if they are on up there for a longer durations we keep sending them these supplies because it's closer to the earth so space station is earth dependent moon is going to be a proving ground our test bed to make mars earth independent mars mission should be earth independent and that's what this picture is talking about um so this is the kind of sustainable lunar architecture we need to have uh, uh, we will we want to perform science on the surface of the moon, um, make our technologies robust so that we can um, take them to Mars. Um, first, we're going to have this, this is the Lunar Gateway. Uh, the mission control center that I'm setting up is for this uh, space station. Uh, this is the Lunar Gateway external robotic system. We're going to have a Canada arm attached to it, this little guy here, like the Canada arm we have on the space station and um, there will be a lunar ter terrain vehicle that will be delivered to the surface. We'll have sustainable operations. We will land the crew. So I'll talk about how, what is the plan for all the Artemis missions um, in a bit. But we will have, we, we will try to set up refueling capabilities. So the purpose of Gateway is not only to be a uh, um, outpost for lunar missions, but also eventually when we go to Mars, it will be like a stopover or a refueling station kind of a um, system when it comes time for the Mars missions. And um, yeah, there will be pressurized rover delivery for um, surface exploration and Gateway will help us um, perform longer, mission, longer duration missions really easily rather than having the lander go directly from here, Earth to Moon, right? So this, this is going to be our um, stopover or outpost. And yes, we'll have a surface habitat as well. So we will have Mars mission simulations uh, on the lunar surface, just like we have Mars analogs here on Earth, right? And we will have Mars analogs on the surface of the moon. So these are the long duration plans, um, the goal of the Artemis missions. Artemis 1 is going to fly. This is its trajectory or flight path. Um, this picture shows. So it flies here. You see it's separating from the boosters and the spacecraft starts flying here. It's going to be in this orbit. This is the furthest uh, human rated spacecraft has gone um, in our solar system. So the first time we're flying, even the Apollo missions have been only up to the moon, right? Uh, you can see how further beyond the moon's orbit we're going to um, be. And then it's going to um, come back here. So this chart just shows the details of this mission. It's going to be about 26 to 42 days. Um, and then return transit will be 9 to 19 days out of that. So um, moving on, let's meet the rocket. So this is a rocket here. You see it here. Um, and this is the picture of the rocket. And this is a real rocket. And I got to go um, see it and take a picture with it um, because I'm like, I've worked on this spacecraft, so I want to go watch the launch, but the launch did not happen, <laughs> uh, but it was good. I ex got to experience that excitement. I watched a launch of the Inspiration4 spacecraft last year, and so I'm like, um, this is the world's most powerful rocket. That, that feeling when I watched the launch of Inspiration4 
um, the smell of the rocket fuel and the vibration and the sounds and the light uh, when the when it launches it was night it was a nighttime launch it was amazing and i kind of got addicted to it <laughs> and so i wanted to watch now how the saturn uh, not saturn sorry sls launch um, look because it is supposed to be the most powerful rocket in the world right how is that going to sound how is that going to feel so i wanted to watch that i don't think i'll be able to go back again um, it's expensive to fly every time but i'll watch it from the mission control center whenever it launches so yeah um, it's been scrubbed a couple of times um, because of issues um, with the fueling system but hopefully november is when we are looking to launch it now um, but yeah we want to do it right right there are a lot of people criticizing nasa for not launching it but we want to do it right it's a test flight it's a test flight that's what test flights are supposed to do you're supposed to learn lessons and um, fix the issues and then launch um, just launching it and letting it blow up and then again you're going to have a lot of other issues so this is why we are taking our time and we are fixing all the issues and then going to launch it so you see this picture here um, this is the orion spacecraft upper stage um, the rl10 engine that's going to propel um, the spacecraft further away from earth um, this is the core stage and then the solid rocket boosters uh, as you see it's going to have a thrust of 8.8 .8 million um, pounds and it's it's the most powerful as you see compared to the saturn 5 and the space shuttle um, so 13 uh, I, I mean yeah and it's going to be able to carry a lot of cargo as well um, to the moon so this is what's going to allow us to go beyond the lunar orbit even I mean, that's how powerful it is um, some more information about the moon rocket or the space launch system and the orion and the, together they form um, the first flight for the artemis mission this is going to be an uncrewed flight because it's again a test flight um, it's going to fly around the moon and it's going to come back um, so it's flown in 2014 actually but it's been in orbit around the earth so that was its first um, test flight as well and um, what are we going to do in, in addition to all of that in the Artemis mission? So there are going to be a lot of small CubeSats on this mission. For example, um, the Omoto Nashi, it's been designed by the JAXA, Japanese Space um, Organization. Uh, this is a small, because we're going to land astronauts, we're going to have a lander go to the surface of the moon, right? Um, so we want to understand the trajectory and the details of that flight and so we are launching this sat cubesat um, to study the trajectory um, maneuver it uh, in the lunar orbit and from the orbit to the surface so th these are all cubesats that have different missions they'll be launched from the spacecraft um, once it arrives in the lunar orbit orbit this is orion uh, just a rendition of the Orion spacecraft. It's supposed to seat seven to eight astronauts, but I don't think we'll go full capacity ever. Uh, four astronauts is what we're hoping or guessing will launch to Mars for the first time. But the Artemis 1 mission, we're going to launch only two astronauts um, in this mission, um, Artemis 3 mission. A little bit about the um, gateway. This is how the gateway is going to be. It's not going to be as big as the International Space Station. The International Space Station is the size of a football stadium, right? Um, this is going to be smaller. There are going to be several modules on this. Um, it's an international partnership. So we're going to have ESA, um, Canadian Space And then JAXA is going to provide some as well. Russia is not participating in this as of now, but Russia had a module. Um, scheduled to launch for this as well so not sure what's that what what ha what's happening with that but this is how our gateway configuration looks um, from nasa so nasa is going to provide the power and propulsion element and um, the logistics um, module so in 2025 we will be launching just the power propulsion element ppe and the halo module which is the habitation and logistics module, uh, habitation and logistics outpost. 
these will be launched in 2025 uh, and after that we will have several launches to for these modules and then they'll be connected to the gateway orion comes in docks to the uh, gateway Th this is how it's going to work in the future and then the astronauts take the lander which will be attached to the gateway somewhere and they'll go to the surface of the moon there will be a habitation module a u.s habitation module international habitation module uh, multi-purpose module the canada arm three um, so and then this is the logistics resupply um, a module. So these are, this is how the gateway is going to come together. And this is, this is ESA's uh, picture of the gateway. Um, as you see here again, they have a refueler here, habitation, the halo module I was talking about, the PPE module. Um, Canadian Space Agency is going to have the uh, robotics. There's the human lander system that astronauts will take to the surface. And um, again, the same thing, I'll not repeat that. Uh, but yeah, this is how the gateway is going to look and it's going to be in a um, ha halo orbit uh, as well. Uh, then we have the human landing system, which we've awarded SpaceX the contract for. So they're going to um, design our first human landing system. So the first goal now, after Artemis 1 flies this year, then this next step is Artemis 2, which is going to be Two astronauts on board the spacecraft but they will fly around the moon and come back so in that we will be testing our uh, capabilities for a crewed mission right the unmanned this is an unmanned flight for artemis one artemis two will be a manned flight so there will be systems like the displays that i showed you earlier um, we want to test how they perform on the test flight uh, how can they handle the rigor of going around the moon and coming back and then in artemis three the astronauts, two astronauts will go, the first woman and the first man of color. They will go directly from Earth to the surface of the moon. There's no gateway yet in picture because gateway is going to take a little time to um, be built and launched. Um, so after Artemis 3, then that is going to be a seven day mission. Um, the Artemis 3 mission when we'll have boots on the ground for the first time. Then Artemis 4 will be where we will have our astronauts go to the gateway, they'll dock to the gateway, then they'll take the lander to the surface. So that's Artemis 4. Uh, that will happen sometime in 2027. <laughs> so at that time, I think we can start saying we are setting up our sustainable base on the moon. Um, and this is just a, a NASA's uh, image rendition of the base camp. We will have a habitat, we will have rovers, and um, we'll, we'll be setting up habitat over here for a long duration, sustainable human presence. But initially for the seven days when the Artemis three mission, the astronauts launch in that mission, they're going to just stay in the spacecraft. It's a short duration mission. But I think inflatable habitats will be the best and we're exploring our options for setting up habitats. Uh, this again, oh, this tells you the same thing that I talked about, the path to the lunar surface. Artemis one is here on the left, first human spacecraft to the moon first humans to orbit the moon in the 21st century. That's Artemis II. Then we'll have Artemis support missions, first high power solar electric propulsion system, uh, another support mission. So we'll have to fly support missions to start setting things up, right? First, so this is the SCP. First unpressure, uh, sorry, first pressurized module delivered to the gateway. Uh, this is the lander. And then human landing system delivered to the gateway. That's with the lander. And then finally, Artemis 3, which is a crewed mission. This is a little bit outdated. There's not going to be a crewed mission to the gateway. It's going to be directly to the lunar surface. So, And then Artemis 4 will be crewed mission to gateway and lunar surface. And from there on, we will start having this regular pattern of crewed mission to the gateway and then down to the um, lunar surface. But yeah, this, this is our plan. This is our path uh, of... And eventually, I think by the end of this decade, we will have a sustainable um, human presence on the surface of the moon. How cool is that, right? And it's great to be um, part of this um, entire endeavor. Um, it's a challenge building, setting up this mission control center is a challenge. A lot of um, meetings and a lot of effort I have to put in from my side as well, 
it's not easy being the project lead working with different teams and uh, trying to get information plus our partners are a little behind on the modules that they are building the ppe and the halo module so despite delays from their side we have to keep going so i'm learning all those things until now i was an engineer at nasa now i'm like the project manager and so putting on my project manager cap in addition to an engineer engineering cap um, it's it's challenge because you tend to think like an engineer and you have to think like a project manager so how do you find that balance so i'm learning that right now um, and like my mentor keeps telling me she keeps hold telling don't waste your time on technical meetings that's not your job but being an engineer i want to look into the technical things so uh, yeah it's been fun it's a fun experience enjoying it and um, i'm i'm glad i i've come this far and i'm able to contribute to these missions so i think we are um, done i wanted to keep some time for question answers um, thank you i hope that you learned something new and you enjoyed what i talked about i'm on social media you can connect with me um, but yeah let's stop sharing and then we can open the floor for questions you guys are still with me right audible yeah you are audible okay yes ma'am uh, thank you for this amazing session i think uh, your journey continues to inspire all the people that have uh, uh, with us our webinar today and be it your academic achievements or all the uh, diversity in your work all the projects that you have worked on uh, be the unlock asteroid missions or uh, the kepa mission and every other thing that you have done i think i can't uh, hear i can't hear you very well and my my speak, no. speaker is at full volume so uh, am i the volume is a little uh, uh, the volume was a little less and then you were breaking up a little uh, is it better now yeah a little better uh am i audible now yeah well, the volume is still a little lower i don't know why but it's okay okay uh, so ma'am firstly uh, i would like to thank you for uh, giving such an amazing webinar to all our viewers uh, i think we are uh, really uh, honored to have you uh, given your uh, academic achievements or your work in so many diverse fields i think it is going to be an inspiration for all our, all our viewers as well as us and uh, at the same time uh, i would also like to thank you because uh, your journey uh, continues to inspire all the students here uh, all the students in us and also we would like to open the floor for questions now so i would ask the yeah. viewers to put their questions in the chat window and uh, we would convey them uh, to the speaker yeah so i saw one asking uh, facebook id so i just i'm sharing the slide about the contact information there again Okay. No questions? Yay. <laughs> Was it something new you guys got to learn or see or have you seen this information before just so I know? <laughs> okay, there is one question in chat. Uh, Ma'am, can you please give some tips for me, an aspiring astronaut, to increase skill sets? I have just finished bachelor's mm -hmm. uh, in degree, bachelor's degree. Okay, sure. Yeah. So, um, tips like my path has been very different, but what I can see, and it depends on where you are applying to be an astronaut, right? Um, so, in the U.S., um, you first criteria is you need to have a citizenship, and then second is U.S. is um, the NASA has changed the eligibility criteria earlier. Even a bachelor's degree would allow you to apply. Now you have to have a master's degree and some work experience, and that to a master's degree in science, technology, engineering, math, one of these uh, streams. 
So yeah, get you you are you're finishing your bachelor's degree. You're saying I don't know what the degree is in, but get a master's degree as well. The higher your education, the better your chances. Um, and look at me, I had three masters and I have all these things that I've done, but I still didn't make it in the last uh, round of uh, selection, right? So there are very, very extremely highly qualified people um, who apply. So develop those. Educational qualifications is what you earn first. And while you're doing that, get this, these are not requirements NASA specifies, but uh, flying, pilot skills, uh, scuba diving, um, and then uh, a lot of hands-on projects. If you can do things like that, that will definitely um, help you. Um, and there's another way because NASA hires a lot of military pilots, test pilots, right? Uh, even at the last round, you look 50 to 60% of the folks that are hired are uh, from the military. And if I had that ch chance, I would have done that. And growing up, when I wanted to become an astronaut, I was um, attempting to become a fighter pilot, even though India did not have, it did not even accept women as fighter pilots, right? But I, the only uh, person I knew who was an astronaut in India was Rakesh Sharmaji, and he was a fighter pilot. So my goal was to become a fighter pilot because if you become a fighter pilot, then you can become an astronaut, right? And even NASA has that because you're flying new spacecrafts. So only test pilots can handle the rigor of flying a new uh, spacecraft. And that is why test pilots are preferred. So if you have the scope, you're young, it sounds like, you can join the Air Force as well and become a fighter pilot, um, build those skills. Thousand hours of flying minimum is necessary if you're not if you're applying in the military category um, and if you're not a civilian. And then the civilian pool gets smaller because all this larger pool is occupied by the military pilots. But that's the civilian pool I fall in under. And like uh, last time in 2020, uh, there was just one month when NASA astronaut application was open and there were 12,000 applicants. Out of that, I heard 7,000 were uh, engineers. In that pool, I am an engineer as well, right? So how do you make yourself stand out? And out of those 7,000, there, there might have been a lot of PhDs. So NASA will look at the PhDs because they become like the top uh, in that pool, right? So this is how you think and you um, develop your skills. But there is no guarantee, trust me. No matter how many skills I develop, I know there is a 0.0001% chance of getting picked. That's how tough uh, the astronaut selection process is because imagine, in 2016, there were two, uh, 18,000 applicants. Last round, there were 12,000 applicants. Out of that, they just select 10 or 12 or 14 astronauts, right? So how much is your chance? And um, But the thing is, you have to keep trying. And there are a lot of NASA astronauts who applied not once, twice, five times even. And there was one who started applying very young, like when he was fresh out of college, he started applying. Uh, so he's applied 13 times. Can you believe that? So, um, but that's why I say don't, yes, this is a good goal to have, but it's the toughest goal to have. And so have a backup plan, have a career that will keep you fulfilled and happy, right? That's what I'm doing. I'm working here on space exploration missions while pursuing that childhood dream. No guarantee that dream will come true, but am I giving up? No, I'm enjoying my work here. And I'm also pursuing that um, on the side. So have that balance so that you won't be really disappointed. Can I do my master's in physics and be an astronaut? Yes, you can. Uh, physics is a STEM degree, right? So definitely you can. But like I said, the more qualifications you have, the better you are. So don't stop at a physics uh, master's. If you have the opportunity, do a PhD as well, I would say. Okay, let me see. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at the questions here so that we don't waste time in the questions coming through, through you guys to me. Um, Bharti says, ideal. Thank you, Bharti. Um, I hope you learned uh, something from my sessions. What will the Artemis missions be accomplished? When? When will they be accomplished? So for now, we have planned until Artemis 4, which is 2027, when astronauts will dock to the gateway. But we are not going to stop at that because we have to build a sustainable base and perform research, right? So they will keep going for like, you remember Apollo, how many missions did we have? 17 missions we've flown 
and then there were some unsuccessful attempts before that as well so we will keep flying um, till nasa decides okay now we are ready uh, to go to mars but for now what i know officially is four missions uh, have been planned facility right now where we can have astronaut training see like project possum it trains you um, then there is there are private organizations coming up but what i'll tell you as a student who is still dependent on their parents you should not do this <laughs> it costs a lot of money and it's not going to guarantee you a chance to fly in space i've done the project possum training uh, i have flown research missions but trust me i have to put money every time from my own pocket and it's not a small amount and so um, i have always said this once you start earning once you have a job you are independent you're going to use your money like i did right that's when you should do these kind of, of endeavors not as as a student um, it's very expensive don't waste money on this right now gather your qualifications make yourself uh, worthy of it right if you want to spend such a huge amount make yourself worthy because it's not that you do the training and you'll be hired no nope. you have it, it, there's no guarantee of getting uh, uh, getting to fly in space once you complete the training so don't keep those kind of false hopes and that's what i worry about when i'm seeing a lot of <laughs> training and everything starting in india it is really e easy to uh, misdirect people right Uh, on this and i've i've come from a very simple family background in india i know the value of um, our parents hard earned money and so i make it a point even though i might sound like i'm anti all this thing that folks are doing running these trainings and stuff no this was one of my ideas that i shared when during uh, my interview and talks in india few years ago that i want to start something in training but i i stopped why didn't i continue with that because um India is not at that stage yet where we are going to have that regular space flight and not everyone can come outside the country to fly right so we need to be practical and um i also thought that just starting a training for the sake of it for earning money doesn't uh, make sense because unless there is a proper masters level program if you look at our um, um bachelors and masters programs in aeronautics in india they are more um, aer aeronautics and some space focused not a lot of space focus space science human factors in space these things are missing and i wanted to try and start a program like that with also affiliated with the university um, but people discouraged me in india that takes a long time and i did not have that bandwidth to commit to that so um, starting a masters program in a university was going to involve a lot of government stuff documentation so i gave up on that but bottom line what i'm saying is yes for the fun of it you do the astronaut training but when you are ready to spend out of your own pocket and not your parents pockets until then focus on your education don't get um, like it's all it looks fancy it sounds like fun but don't get uh, into all of that uh, first put down put down a solid foundation which is your education and working on these kind of projects uh, and challenges that nasa has even isro has started doing that now right putting out uh, challenges for students and educational programs participate in those okay aeronautical engineering great daya that's a good degree to have uh yes um if uh, okay i'm doing my bachelor's from cis what is are you saying con computer science can i do masters physics yes like i said any degree in the stem fields it will make you eligible to apply to the astronaut program but again remember uh, you have uh, if you're focusing on the us astronaut program the nasa astronaut program these are the requirements i shared with you i don't know if isro has put out a, a, an astronaut requirement chart or something right now astronauts in isro are going to be test pilots like they they've selected four test pilots and all male i was hoping they would select at least one female no they've gone and selected all male which was a disappointment <laughs> there should have been one female we have female test pilots right why did an isro pick one uh, but yeah I, i i wanted to become a gaganaut and i tried to reach out to lalitha mika ma'am um, but i knew that like nasa did with apollo missions all test pilots they went to select uh, test pilots and that's what they did but all male but yes 
right now through ISRO, if you want to become an astronaut, your best thing is get into the Air Force and become a fighter pilot. You might have a chance. Uh, but yeah, uh, for NASA astronaut program, you do need to have a, a master's in a STEM degree. But first, you need to have a citizenship. So maybe you should think about that as well. Uh, questions in voice in Hindi. Tushar is saying, Tushar, you can ask in Hindi. I don't know about voice, um, but I'll answer if you ask in Hindi. Uh, how to become an astronaut? Give me tips. Basic physics. If you want to become an astronomer, Rohit, get the highest qualification. Go for a master's. Uh, go for a PhD. I think in India, in Pune, there is uh, the Ayuka. What is the long form? I don't remember. They are into astronomy. So check them out. Um, if, and find out what organizations in um, India are into astronomy and look at their uh, job requirements uh, or what job postings they have and what do they need, what qualifications. And that's the best way to uh, go. OK, so, yeah, like I said, you guys can connect with me on social media, but please be patient. I, if I don't reply right away, uh, get a lot of messages. Um, and I try to avoid one-on-one -on -one, uh, because then it takes up a lot of my time, right? Uh, so this is the opportunity, Tushar. If you have a question, please post here. I'll stay a few minutes longer and answer. Uh, yeah. So post it here and I'll be happy. Thank you for all these comments. Um, myopic, how did you head it straight to the goal? Yes, I was myopic um, and... But the thing is, I, in 2004, I knew I wanted to do all this. I wanted to swim. I wanted to fly. And I wanted to get rid of the glasses. So I um, got a LASIK surgery done. And it went so well. So it's like your luck factor and how your body uh, reacts also, right? That it's been how long now? 2004. I am I have had a perfect 2020 vision since then. So even the eye doctors who check my eyes, they tell me that we can't tell when we look at your eyes that, You've had surgery until you mentioned that to us. There is no scars. Otherwise, they say normally we see scars of surgery. So it went well for me, thankfully. And so, yeah, if you have that, again, when you start working, earning, get a, a LASIK done. And that freedom from glasses helps you do so many things, I can tell you. All right. Uh, how are you satisfied by um, in Indian education system? Um, yeah, I think I'm coming from the Indian education system, right? But we have a false, um, like when we were growing up, and we think like we are coming from a simple background. So how will we match up to all these folks from IITs and all, right? Uh, but look at me. I'm from a simple background, a university in Jalgaon. And I'm here today. So it doesn't matter. I tell my boys also. It doesn't matter where you study. What you do of that education that you're getting is what matters. So Indian education system is good. Uh, I've come from that, right? So, But I think what it can use, like I say when I do talks in India also, um, is more practical stuff, more project-based stuff to give students the real-life experience. Even in all the courses I've taken, right? All the courses I've taken for all my masters and even for my PhD, we have a project embedded in each of the courses. So each course has, imagine how many projects I've done. Right now I'm doing a project for one of my PhD courses where we're learning a lot about orbital mechanics also. And so that involves, so I'm using the SMAD book, which is the Space Mission Analysis and Design Engineering. There's a new version of that one engineering book so we are uh, me and my um, classmate we're planning to do a project on a mars recycler so a shuttle system between mars orbit and earth orbit basically one day it will become a reality right so these kind of projects so in that we will have to take consideration of the earth orbit martian orbit how is our shuttle going to travel between those two orbits how long will it take so we'll have to get down into the details of the trajectory uh, the time and all those apply all the equations and come up with the best solution, right? So these kind of projects should be involved in at every course level, at least at master's and PhD and bachelor's level um, in, in the Indi Indian education program system. Uh, that's what I can say, more practical stuff. And, and then projects, internships, uh, more organizations in India should open up opportunities for students to intern at their um, 
companies every year actually summer and winter internships like nasa has summer internship spring internship fall internship so students get the opportunity to come intern at nasa uh, okay so I, i think i answered almost all the questions so far uh, tushar you still haven't answered your question <laughs> don't message me on linkedin or instagram if you didn't ping ask your question so i'll give okay let him unmute himself and ask his question and then we can be done okay sure tushar are you speaking i can't hear you can you ask uh, your question yeah, ma hello ma'am i'm audible yes yes you are क्या मैं हिंदी में बात कर सकता हूँ मैंने अंग्रेजी हाँ, करो करो हिंदी में बात करो मैं भी हाँ, हिंदी में जवाब देती हूँ मैं तो मैं दो सवाल है पहले सवाल हाँ. ये है कि आप आर्टिमेस मिशन में जा रहे हैं आप मून में जाएंगे मून पे जाएंगे या मार्स पे जाएंगे वो मुझे नहीं पता अगर वो जा रहे हैं तो मून से आगे जाएंगे तो आपका सुरक्षा का क्या रहेगा मतलब कि एस्ट्रोनॉट के सुरक्षा की रहेगी क्या व्यवस्था होगी और दूसरा सवाल ये है कि अगर किसी भारत अभी भारत के जो स्टूडेंट अभी पढ़ रहे हैं वो नासा में जाके एस्ट्रोनॉट या फिर इस तरह से कुछ करना चाहते तो उसके लिए क्या गाइडेंस होगी उसके लिए कुछ आप एक कर सकते तो अच्छा रहेगा थैंक यू यही मेरे दोस्त करते हैं अच्छा ठीक है थैंक यू क्वेश्चन के लिए Uh, पर पहला क्वेश्चन क्या था आपका कि आर्टेमिस uh, जो मिशन है तुषार वो मून के लिए है मार्स के लिए प्रिपेयर करने के लिए है पर मून पे फोकस्ड है वो अभी मार्स पे नहीं जा रहे जब हम ये टेक्नोलॉजीज मून पे टेस्ट कर लेंगे तो फिर तब फिर मार्स की मिशन प्लान होगी और वो शायद 2035 में होगा तो अभी मार्स का कुछ प्लानिंग uh, नहीं है एस्ट्रोनॉट्स को भेजने का अभी सिर्फ मून पर है पर उसके बाद आपने कुछ तो पूछा कि एस्ट्रोनॉट्स के लिए क्या होगा मार्स पे जाएंगे तो तो वैसे भी अभी कुछ प्लान किया नहीं है एस्ट्रोनॉट्स के लिए मार्स के लिए तो इट्स ओनली फॉर मून मून पे जाने वाले हैं एस्ट्रोनॉट्स और फिर दूसरा सवाल था कि अगर स्टूडेंट्स को नासा या इसरो में एस्ट्रोनॉट बनने के लिए ज्वाइन करना है तो उनको क्या करना चाहिए तो नैसा में पहला क्राइटेरिया जैसे मैंने बताया कि आपको यूएस सिटीजन होना जरूरी है और इसका रीजन ये है रीजन भी बताती हूँ क्योंकि हर बार मैं बताती हूँ मुझे बुरा लगता है कि मैं बोलती हूँ कि नहीं आप नहीं हो सिटीजन तो आप नहीं कर सकते हो नासा में रीजन uh, ये है कि देखो एस्ट्रोनॉट uh, बनना या स्पेस प्रोग्राम ये एक एरोस्पेस एंड डिफेंस का हिस्सा होता है हर कंट्री का राइट right? तो जैसे इसरो हायर करेगा क्या अमेरिकन सिटीजन को आज मुझे भी इसरो हायर नहीं करेगा क्योंकि मैं इंडियन सिटीजन नहीं हूँ राइट right? तो हर कंट्री अपने सिटीजन्स को ही अपने स्पेस प्रोग्राम में इन्वॉल्व करती है इसलिए सिटीजनशिप क्राइटेरिया बहुत जरूरी होता है तो वैसे ही नासा के लिए भी यूएस सिटीजन होना जरूरी है इसरो के लिए इंडियन सिटीजन होना जरूरी है और फिर अगर मेरी तरह अगर आप यहाँ आते हो यूएस जॉब के लिए काम के लिए आते हो किसी स्पॉन्सर को जैसे मैं एच वीजा पे आई थी यहाँ पे सॉफ्टवेयर इंजीनियर बन काफी साल पहले और फिर आप बहुत रुकना पड़ता है सिटीजन बनने के लिए मुझे 12 साल रुकना पड़ा था आजकल 20-20 साल रुक रहे हैं मेरे काफी सारे फ्रेंड्स हैं जिनके सिटीजनशिप के इवन ग्रीन कार्ड के भी एप्लीकेशन काफी सालों से चल रहे हैं तो इमिग्रेशन बहुत टफ होता जा रहा है बट या आप यहाँ आ सकते हो किसी और जॉब पे और फिर आप मेरी तरह ये सब क्वालिफिकेशन अर्न करो वेट आउट करो नैसा सिटीजन बनने के लिए पहले ग्रीन कार्ड फिर सिटीजन ये लॉन्ग प्रोसेस है आप में इतना पेशेंस है रुको देखो मैं यहाँ किस स्टेज पे आई और आज तक मैं नहीं बन पाई हूँ एस्ट्रॉन तो ये सब प्रैक्टिकली सोचो प्लान करो एंड वेट करने की तैयारी रखो कि पेशेंट रहना पड़ेगा ऐसा नहीं है कि आपने चाहा कि अरे एक दो साल तो रुक गया अभी बस होना चाहिए अभी नहीं ऐसा नहीं होता है यू हैव टू वेट इट आउट बहुत साल रुकना पड़ता है इसरो में ज्वाइन करने के लिए आज के बेसिस पे बिकॉज इसरो की अभी तक एक भी ह्यूमन स्पेस फ्लाइट अभी तक एक भी एस्ट्रोनॉट लॉन्च नहीं हुआ है राइट right? और उन्होंने पहले चार जो किए हैं वो टेस्ट पायलट्स हायर किए हैं जिनको उन्होंने एस्ट्रोनॉट्स बनाना है तो इसरो में अभी अगर आपको ज्वाइन करना है शुरू की फ्लाइट्स में शायद इसरो सिर्फ आ, उसके बाद इसरो नॉन मिलिट्री लोगों को मतलब हमारे जैसे सिविलियंस को भी लेंगे तो उसके लिए अगर आप पी किसी भी 
साइंस टेक्नोलॉजी इंजीनियरिंग या मैथ इन फील्ड्स में पीएचडी लोगे साइकोलॉजी नहीं चलेगा एविएशन नहीं चलेगा इट हैज टू बी साइंस इंजीनियरिंग मैथ और टेक्नोलॉजी तो वो मैं ऐसा के बेसिस पे बता रही हूँ कि शायद इसरो भी ऐसा करेगा तो वो वैसे पीएचडी डिग्री लोगे तो इट विल बी द हाइएस्ट क्वालिफिकेशन राइट तो भले कितने भी मास्टर्स डिग्री वाले लोग हो अगर आपके पास पीएचडी तो आप सबसे ऊपर स्टैंड आउट करोगे नैसा में तो वो है फ्लाइंग हो सकता है पायलट का लाइसेंस ले लो स्कूबा ड्राइविंग का लाइसेंस ले लो ये स्किल्स लिखे नहीं होते हैं कि चाहिए उनको बट ये अन, एक अनरिटन थिंग है कि गुड टू हैव स्किल्स अच्छे स्किल्स है अगर आपके पास हो तो और फिर प्रोजेक्ट पे काम करो जैसे नैसा के बहुत सारे स्टूडेंट चैलेंजेस होते काफी सारे इंडिया से स्टूडेंट्स आए हुए हैं यहाँ अपने प्रोजेक्ट्स प्रेजेंट करने के लिए तो वो कर सकते हो और इसरो भी अभी वैसे प्रोग्राम्स कर रहा है स्टूडेंट्स के लिए तो देखते रहो उनकी वेबसाइट्स पे जाओ देखो क्या अपॉर्चुनिटीज है स्टूडेंट्स के लिए और उनमें पार्टिसिपेट करते रहो ठीक है आई थिंक मैंने डिटेल में आंसर दिया है तो आई होप इट हेल्प Um, can you just summarize us in one or two lines for uh, someone who doesn't understand Hindi? There's someone who is asking for translation in English. Okay. Abhi <laughs> kya? <laughs> what do you want? What do you guys want me to translate? Yeah, like I said, for any so, for for all space organizations, their criteria is that the the um, applicant has to be a citizen of their country because aerospace and defense is a sensitive area, right? so like isro will want you to be an indian citizen if you want to apply nasa will want you to be an a us citizen so first criteria you have to be citizen of that uh, country to apply to that space program second criteria is um, get a phd i will say yes masters nasa mentions that you can have a masters but a phd will make you stand out further from all the other candidates who have masters right uh, so if possible for you get a phd in science technology engineering math Uh, no degrees like psychology or aviation or stuff like that what else did i say uh, indian uh, isro isro will initially be hiring mostly test pilots for its gaganna gaganaut program first flight because isro hasn't even flown yet right so the first flight will happen then the second flight will happen they will get a lot of data about the spacecraft and what they need to make change and if they can continue flying but um, yeah Uh, Israel will hire test pilot, so try to get into the Indian Air Force, become a fighter pilot. So be the best at what you do. Okay, don't compete with others, but what you are doing, compete with yourself. Be the best at what you do, um, so that you stand out amongst the hundreds of applicants. Um, that's a, that's what I would um, suggest. Okay, and that's a great advice. Ah, uh, if it's okay, can we take just one last question because we have already sure. ended so last, much. Last, last. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Kushi, uh, you can unmute yourself. So yeah. So I have a question. Uh, that uh, actually I am currently studying in grade eleven, and I'm from India. And so if we have a study visa for America, then after that, how many years does it takes to get the citizenship of USA? Oh. you are on student visa right so students can't yeah. apply for us citizenship so you have to find work first you you if you have a work visa then you can work uh, in the us and then your your company you can't direct if you apply um, i don't think um, it, it will it's going to happen very soon <laughs> even for family if i apply for my sister even it's going to take 20 30 years that's the wait time right now but your employer like our employer applied for our green card when we came on the h1b visa then once you get the green card then you can apply for citizenship by yourself right but first you need uh, someone who will sponsor your work visa a company who will sponsor your work visa and then but as a student you can come here and i think i don't know a lot about student visa you can study but and maybe you can work here for a year after you study or something uh, but then after that then during that time if you find someone who will sponsor your work visa that's good otherwise then i think you you have to come back to india or something so yeah it, so im- imagine you come on student visa you study for four years for your batch someone hires you on h1b visa it takes 
uh, then they have to sponsor your uh, green card. So why will they sponsor your green card in the first year, right? You have to be with them for a long period of time. So imagine you are with them for two to three years, then they sponsor your green card. Green card takes, it used to take six years. Now it takes longer than six years. Don't ask me how many, you should check the immigration website. <laughs> uh, but then after that, uh, another six years for you to become a citizen after you get the green card. So it's a long, long wait time. Thanks, ma'am. And thanks for this amazing sec uh, session too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It was a pleasure. And I hope you guys enjoyed it too. And uh, yeah, if there are no more questions, you all have a great evening and a great weekend. Thank you so much, ma'am, for this amazing, wonderful insights towards Artemis mission. And I guess the coming decade looks very promising towards deep space human human related missions as well as technology yes. development, right? From powering up and building up the next generation of reactors for powering up the bees. Um, yeah. I guess we can wrap up the session today and eagerly looking forward to November for Artemis one launch. Oh, absolutely. Yep, me too. So okay, cool. Thank you, everyone. Have a great uh, weekend. And I'll see you. Bye. Namaste. Thank you so much, man. Thank you.